Right friends, welcome back to a tutorial discussion. Today we have 5 issues and the last issue we are going to deliberate on 15th finance commission. It is into the news because of one particular press information bureau item and in this context, let us recapitulate some aspects pertaining to 15th finance commission and one important aspect is terms of reference given to the 15th finance commission. So friends, we have 5 issues today, 3 from the Hindu one from Indian Express, one from Press Information Bureau. Right Before going ahead, there is one announcement. Friends, editorial discussions is the mother of the current affairs. Let me repeat once again. Editorial discussions is the mother of the current affairs because we deliberate different shades of opinion and in that context, lot of points will emanate which are important from prelims perspective also, right. In this context, let me tell you, last year we presented 16 modules of brainstorming with the rewind of 10 months editorials and on similar lines, we are going to present 20 modules by taking brainstorming with the rewind of 10 months editorials with the prelims focus. Friends, these modules are expected to start from tomorrow. So friends, by taking important aspects, whatever we have discussed in the editorials during the past 10 months, we are going to present as brainstorming with the rewind of 10 months editorials. Last year we presented 16 modules. This year we are going to present 20 modules and you can expect number of questions from these modules and friends, as we have already promised, 80 modules in the current affairs and out of 80 revision modules, 20 will be from the editorials and they constitute all the aspects without segregation and remaining 60 modules, that means 80 modules, 20 brainstorming and 60 modules will be revision modules, total put together, there will be 80 so, what I mean to say is, out of these 80 modules, 20 will be segregated with exclusively brainstorming sessions from the editorial discussions, right? So, total constitutes 80, 60 as other modules which are bifurcated into various domains like art and culture, economy, polity like that and 60 plus 20. And these 20 modules are exclusively from the brainstorming with whatever we have discussed in the editorial discussions. Right friends, these editorial discussions are the mother of the current effects. Let me repeat once again, because if I look back, then I found a lot of important concepts were taught through these editorial discussions. Right. And let us look at the first one. This is about Maldivian wave. Now, revitalizing the ties between India and Maldives is the need of the hour. Why? The important aspect is critically analyze the forays of China in the Indian Ocean region. In this context, examine the need for revitalized bilateral ties between India and Maldives. All of you are familiar in the previous regime of Abdullah Amin, Maldives tilted towards China. And now it is golden opportunity to India to revitalize the relations because of the advent of Mr. Soli, right? And the first question, first statement rather, which I have mentioned here, critically analyze the forays of China in the Indian Ocean region. And why people are talking about forays of China in the Indian Ocean region? Let me tell you five minutes through this map. First and the foremost, Start from Chittagong port. In fact, it is funding Chittagong port. China is funding Chittagong port which is being developed in Bangladesh. Second important aspect, recently an agreement was signed for the development of Kyakpyu port. Kyakpyu port is very important and this is in Myanmar and this Kyakpyu port will be developed by China. Right? And this is in the Rakhine province of Myanmar. I am talking about the forays of China in the Indian Ocean region. First, it is going to assist 
in building the Chittagong port. Second, it is developing this Kyakpu port. Third, let us look at this Hambantota port. Hambantota port is in Sri Lanka recently. Hambantota port was given on 99 year lease. 99 year lease to China by Sri Lanka. Right? So, this is the third important aspect. Fourth, Gwadar port that is being developed as part of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPEC which in turn is part of Belt and Road Initiative. So friends, this is the fourth aspect. Fifth, Djibouti port. Here China established its naval base. Right? And six is Mombasa port. Where is Mombasa? Mombasa is in Kenya and China is developing Mombasa to Nairobi railway line and huge debt because of that there are news reports that Mombasa port may be handed over to China right friends right from Chittagong right up to Mombasa in between this is Kakpu, this is Hambantota, this is Gwadar, this is port of Djibouti, this is Mombasa. So friends China's forays are clear in the Indian Ocean region, in our backyard, China's forays, if it is developing the assets, tomorrow it will in fact establish naval bases, that is inevitable. So under these circumstances, what is important for India is, India and Maldives, these ties should be revitalized, that means they must be strengthened. By the by, please don't forget. This equator passes through Maldives and Indonesia in Asia, please don't forget. And this next important aspect, Chagos Islands. Chagos Islands is the bone of contention between Mauritius and the United Kingdom, don't forget. And what India has to do? India has to revitalize the ties with Maldives, that is the most important aspect. And India is now in that direction only for revitalizing the ties with Maldives. Second important aspect is India is going to develop the facilities at Agalega Islands. Please don't forget Agalega Islands is in the Indian Ocean region. India is going to develop the facilities in Agalega Islands. Agalega is part of Mauritius, don't forget. And India is trying to develop facilities at this Assumption Island. Assumption Island is of Seychelles, don't forget. So friends, India is trying to counter China's forays into the Indian Ocean region. Right friends, so therefore revitalizing the ties with Maldives assumed utmost significance in this context. Right, and Maldivian Democratic Party is poised to win more than 60 out of 87 seats. Please don't forget the parliament name is Muslis and if the party of Ibrahim Muhammad Soli gets this type of two-thirds majority, then he can push his agenda with the fewer stumbling blocks and Maldives is crucial in halting China and India is moving in that direction. Have a glance at it. When Mr. Soli visited India, $1.4 billion of financial assistance package for Maldives was announced. Don't forget. Right? So, warm bilateral ties is the need of the hour. The reasons I explained you a short while ago. This is to halt China's forays into the Indian Ocean region. And please don't forget, some analysts said, influx of Chinese infrastructure investment under Abdullah Amin government may have caused the Maldives national debt Maldives national debt increased abnormally. So friends, under these circumstances, what is important is the bilateral ties between India and Maldives should reach higher level. Similarly, India and Mauritius. Similarly, India and Seychelles. These are the countries which facilitate India's forays into the Indian Ocean region. I hope this is more than sufficient. Let us look at the next important article in the Hindu. Yesterday we deliberated about it by taking Indian Express article. But some important issues are there. That's why I have taken once again. Here, accountability and transparency. 
these are the basic tenets of modern democracies across the globe judiciary cannot be an exception collegium system cannot function with the, that type of opacity transparency and accountability this is the need of the hour so discuss especially in the context of collegium system of indian judiciary accountability and transparency these are the basic tenets in the era of modern constitutions right friends yesterday we deliberated supreme court whether it is public authority or not that means the issue pertains to whether the correspondence between the collegium and the center can it be made public or not supreme court said no then the matter went to central information commission central information commission said yes it is to be given supreme court again said no it went to delhi high court delhi high court said yes it is to be given supreme court again said no it appealed to itself the matter is with the constitutional bench of the supreme court to decide whether the chief justice of india is the public authority or not right friends the matter dragged on for 10 years to decide about the chief justice of india is the public authority under rti act or not when such type of matters are dragging for 10 years how a common man expect justice from the judiciary this is the pertinent question any common man in this country may be asking here look at it landmark judgment of delhi high court in 2009 what it said it said office of chief justice of india is the public authority that means we can ask information when it is public authority subject to certain restrictions we have already seen there are certain restrictions with regard to personal information otherwise when the institution is declared as public authority it is bound to give information as and when people ask but it can restrict some information yesterday we have seen right so rti as stated by the judge of the delhi high court said 10 years ago rti is a powerful beacon and which illuminates unlit corners of the state activity right and look at it the matters before the constitutional bench the status of chief justice as the public authority then the disclosure of the judges assets then the question of whether the correspondence of the collegium is subject to rti or not these are the issues before the constitution bench right and under these circumstances here can the office of the cji is subject to the rti act or not here all power including judicial power is accountable in a modern constitution very very important in a modern constitution accountability is the norm transparency is the norm of course there may be some restrictions right personal information if somebody asks whether the judge is married or not whether the judge is having any other problems all those things are not to be in the public domain what is important is in the public domain the functioning of judiciary can be in the public domain so therefore accountability transparency are the norms as per the modern constitutions right and if you look at specifically collegium in fact this article is written especially with regard to collegium collegium unfortunately it is judges appointing judges that is the first anomaly judges appointing judges is the first anomaly and such type of thing is not visualized in the constitution that means judges appointing judges is not in fact the feature of the constitution that is evolved over a period of time by the judges themselves then the next important aspect please don't forget it is working without accountability there is less transparency more opacity that's why here you see collegium secrecy is the hallmark secret 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 that is the hallmark of collegium and here this was put into place by the supreme court in order to 
guarantee against judicial independence when judges are appointing judges what is important accountability is important transparency is important so friends when some institution has got the appointing power of its own people at least common man expects accountability and transparency so that is missing from the collegium working right so the important aspect is if you look at the us candidates for judicial appointments they are subjected to public confirmation hearings by the senate then if you see kenya and south africa interviews of candidates are taken by judicial appointment commissions and they are in the public domain or you can say they are broadcast live right and you see collegium that is away from public scrutiny it has immunized itself from any form of public scrutiny and you see the secrecy of collegium one nomination process that is secret deliberations these are secret reasons for elevation or non elevation these are secret and it creates extremely unhealthy climate and judicial appointments were too often made in ad hoc and arbitrary manner right friends opacity actually destroys the institutions right so friends what is important is there should be a mechanism to enforce accountability at the same time to enforce transparency in the judicial appointments and all modern democracies they demand transparency accountability which is missing in the collegium system i hope you got the point look at the next article here the pertinent point i would like to mention through this article is unilateralism is threatening the rule based international order in recent times this is becoming the norm right if you look at united states of america if you look at china china is not honoring the verdict of the south china sea with regard to specific islands it is not honoring the judgment with regard to the south china sea second important aspect usa came out of paris nuclear pact then third important aspect is it is unilaterally recognizing jerusalem as the capital of israel it is recognizing golan heights as part of israel like that you can quote number of examples united states of america came out of joint comprehensive plan of action then there is the rule based international order so therefore rule based international order is under threat or you can say in recent times unilateralism taking the decisions by themselves without going into the rule based international order that is becoming the norm right friends unilateralism is threatening the rule based international order there are specific institutions if you look at the trade wto is there but united states of america is not bothering about the world trade organization whatever way you look at it nowadays rule based international order is under threat right golan heights a question may be expected in the preliminary examination don't forget there is area of separation between syria and the part occupied by israel that is area of separation and this golan heights this side this is lebanon this side this is jordan please don't forget and this is occupied by israel in 1967 it is inhabited by jews and druze sect please don't forget these are important and have you glanced at it and when you are looking at this particular area this is important from prelims perspective and this is sea of galilee that is abutting the golan heights golan heights is the disputed area between syria and israel don't forget why it is into the news because after 52 years donald trump said it is time for united states to fully recognize israel's sovereignty over the golan heights 
what the united nations security council resolutions say united states security council resolutions do not recognize israel's sovereignty over the golan heights but united states of america says that it is time to recognize israel's sovereignty what is the viewpoint of united states of america united states of america says there is a threat from syria because Syria, there is a huge influence of Iran. So, it says there is a threat from Iran through Syria. At the same time, in Lebanon, the Hezbollah militia, they are supported by Iran. So, friends, in the eyes of Israel, in the eyes of United States of America, this Israel is facing a threat because of Iran's presence in Syria, because of this Hezbollah which is supported by Iran in Lebanon. Please don't forget. Because of that, USA says Golan Heights is a part of Israel, right? And see the recent actions of USA with the pro-Israeli stance, right? So, if you club these actions, you can say USA's pro-Israeli stance is evident. At the same time, you can answer my question. That is, unilateralism is giving way or you can say unilateralism is becoming the norm in place of rule-based international order, right? USA president said, it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. USA president said in 2017, at the same time, USA president also proceeded to close the Palestinian office in Washington, D.C. as well as U.S. consulate in Jerusalem dealing with the Palestinian authority. And look at 2018, USA president walked out of this joint comprehensive plan of action with Iran because when the sanctions are removed, Iran will be strengthened. Once Iran will be strengthened, it will become a threat to Israel in the region. So, therefore, to support Israel also, that means it is also one of the reasons why USA came out of joint comprehensive plan of action. Because through this joint comprehensive plan of action, Iran will put or you can say restrictions will be put on the Iran's nuclear program and in return sanctions will be lifted. When sanctions are lifted, Iran will be strengthened. When Iran is strengthened, that will be detrimental to Israel. Because of that, this is one reason you can say, right friends, like this, unilaterally coming out of the international treaties as well as the agreements, that is becoming the norm. There are number of examples when you look at United States of America, right? And what were the efforts by the world community as far as Israel-Palestine is concerned? You can have a glance at it. In fact, UN Security Council resolutions, they asserted clearly inadmissibility of acquisition of territory by force. You cannot acquire the territories by force. So, therefore, they called for withdrawal by Israel. Right? So, there are similar declarations as far as United Nations Security Council resolutions are concerned. And the previous United States of America's policies were in line with the United Nations resolutions. After Donald Trump, there is a change in stance. Right, friends? Quite a pertinent question we answered through this article. Let us continue the discussion of this article. Yesterday, we deliberated two important issues and I will recapitulate those issues. And based on this article, let us continue the third part of the discussion today. The question I am asking is, the present mechanism of punishing the errant judges is far from satisfactory. What is judicial accountability and how much accountability is there? These are the questions, in fact, pertinent to ask. So, friends, let us recollect what we discussed yesterday. Yesterday, we deliberated about there is a need to separate the Supreme Court functioning into constitutional division and legal division as recommended by the Law Commission. Second important aspect we deliberated is, in fact, to look at the Supreme Court's functioning as appellate authority over the high courts. Then, 
we suggested two alternatives. In fact, as per the article, there are two alternatives. The first alternative is provide Supreme Court benches at four places and that is possible through Article 130. No constitutional amendment is required so that the cases need not come to Delhi all the way. And second important aspect is provide courts of appeal as promised by one principal political party, courts of appeal. They are the courts between the Supreme Court and the High Courts. In between, another tier of courts will be constituted so as to look at the appeals from the High Court judgments, right? But this requires constitutional amendment. So, friends, to look at the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, there are two alternatives we deliberated yesterday. And third important aspect through that article we are going to deliberate today here, judicial accountability. And in this context, what is the present mechanism to silence the errant judges? Some judge is into some corruption allegations. What is the mechanism? This we are going to deliberate. And what are the efforts made to ensure judicial accountability in recent times? So, friends, during the past decade, there was an attempt to make judicial accountability, but that has not gone through the parliament, right? And at present, there is no mechanism to ensure the accountability of Supreme Court and the High Court judges. And if somebody is into some corruption, the only way is remove them through the constitutional process of Articles 124.4 and 217.1b. And in 217.1b, it is mentioned the procedure for the removal of High Court judges is also the same as mentioned in 124.4. So, therefore, the removal of High Court judges, the removal of Supreme Court judges, that is as per Article 124.4, right? And but this is quite cumbersome procedure. And so far, no judge has been removed from office through this procedure, right? So, have a glance at it, procedure to remove the judge of the Supreme Court or High Courts. And these may be important from your prelims perspective also. It is applicable to Chief Justice as well. And judge can be removed through Article 124.4 of the Constitution as well as Judges Inquiry Act 1968 and the rules of 1969 and as per article 124.4, please do not forget for the removal of high court judges also, it is mentioned in article 217.1b that the procedure in 124.4 is to be followed even for the removal of the high court judge also and friends here as per article 124.4, judge of the Supreme Court shall not be removed from his office except by an order of the president after an address by each house of parliament and the methodology is mentioned here. It is by the special majority procedure is mentioned here. Motion is to be issued by 100 MPs from Lok Sabha, 50 MPs from Rajya Sabha and it can be either accepted or rejected by the speaker or chairman of the house. So, friends, the decision can be taken by the speaker or the chairman. It is up to the speaker or chairman to admit this removal notice given by 100 MPs from Lok Sabha or minimum 50 MPs from Rajya Sabha. So, it is the prerogative of the speaker or the chairman to accept or reject it. If the motion is accepted, then there is well let down committee committee is to be formed. I mentioned here about the committee and the committee would look into the alleged charges and subsequently it is to be passed by each house with the special majority. All this is most of it is clear to most of you, right? I am not going with detailed explanation here because previously we deliberated and at the same time have a glance at these slides. It is very clear but what is important is this. What were the previous efforts to improve the accountability of judges? What were the previous efforts made to improve the accountability of judges? As we have already seen, the procedure of Article 124.4, 4, 
along with the Judges Inquiry Act. This is the only method to silence the errant judges. But what is the need of the hour is, the need of the hour is to look at accountability of judges. In fact, to introduce accountability, an effort was made in 2010. A bill was introduced in Lok Sabha, that is the Judicial Standards and Accountability Bill 2010 and it has got well laid down mechanism. One is Judicial Oversight Committee. Second one is Compliance Scrutiny Committee. Third one is an Investigation Committee. And this is the procedure or you can say these three committees are enunciated through this bill which was introduced in Lok Sabha. Basically, the purpose of this bill is to examine complaints of misbehavior against the judges and also the judges are required to declare the details of their and their family members assets and liabilities to introduce accountability. This judicial standards and accountability bill was introduced in Lok Sabha which was passed in 2012 by Lok Sabha. Subsequently, there was a lot of opposition, right, due to the opposition by the judges and because of the lack of political consensus, this was in fact could not be passed in Rajya Sabha and it was lapsed due to the dissolution of Lok Sabha in 2014. Right? So, the bill was criticized on the grounds, most important look at it, the bill was criticized on the grounds that the constitution does not permit parliament to assign the task of examining proved misbehavior of judges to an outside agency or committee. So, friends, this bill was criticized because this proved misbehavior, this cannot be entrusted to outside agency or committee. So, therefore, this was criticized on that front due to the lack of political consensus. This could not get through and finally, the bill was lapsed due to the dissolution of the 15th Lok Sabha in 2014. Right, friends? So, judges accountability. This became a distant dream even now also. Right? So, friends, this is all about accountability of judges. So, with regard to the judicial reforms at the level of higher judiciary, three pertinent points we discussed. The first one we discussed is with regard to separating a constitutional division and legal division so as to give more emphasis to constitution related matters. Second important point we discussed is there is a need to have some sort of mechanism to clear the cases whichever are coming from high courts. That means to look at the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Third important aspect, what we have discussed today is there is a need to look at accountability of the judges, right? The only procedure of removal of judges through the constitution that has not given fruits or you can say it cannot be implemented easily. And in addition to that, there is a need to have some sort of accountability by the judges. This is what we have learned through this article, three important aspects, right? Let us leave this discussion here. Before concluding today's editorial, let me look at Press Information Bureau article of 4th April. This is with regard to 15th Finance Commission. Some round table was held with regard to 15th Finance Commission functioning or you can say where do they stand? There were some important issues deliberated. This is about 15th Finance Commission right here. 15th Finance Commission holds high level round table. Why I have taken this? There is some point. Most of the points discussed here will be highly beneficial to the prelims. So friends, this article is mostly relevant for the prelims examination, I would like to tell you 10 to 12 important points on the Finance Commission, right? And it was moderated by N. K. Shing, Chairman of the 15th Finance Commission and it is organized in partnership with World Bank, OECD and ADB. And this news item, this slide may not be that important, but what is important is, let us go back. And we deliberated about 15th Finance Commission in the comprehensive view. And let me tell you few points. Right? So, all of you are familiar. 
Finance Commission is as per Article 281 of the Constitution. It is constituted once in five years and it makes the recommendations for the five year period. Right friends, 15th Finance Commission recommendations, they will be valid from 1st April 2020 right up to 31st March 2025. Please don't forget, it has got chairman and four other members to be appointed by the president. Two, three important points I would like to tell you. First and the foremost, the terms of reference can be given by the president. Most important. Why I am uttering this terms of reference is, in recent times, terms of reference became controversial. So, friends, terms of reference to the Finance Commission can be given by the center. That is the most important aspect. Second is, the commission shall determine their procedure. And the second important aspect is, the commission's powers as decided by parliament by law. Very important. So, friends, two important aspects with regard to the powers of the Finance Commission. Don't forget, the Finance Commission will have the powers. In fact, as Parliament may by law decide. So, the functions of the Finance Commission are decided by the Parliament by law. First point, don't forget. Second important point, any other matter referred to the Commission by the President in the interest of sound finance. That means, the President may give terms of reference to the Commission, don't forget. So, friends, the powers of the Finance Commission that is as per the parliament decision or you can say the functions are decided by the parliament. Second is the president has got the powers to give the terms to the commission in the interest of sound finance. That means terms of reference can be given by the president. Third important aspect is it is for the gross tax revenue certain portion is to be apportioned between the center and the states. That means, gross tax revenue of the center minus, very important, minus collection charges, minus cess, minus surcharge. So, friends, gross tax revenues minus cess, minus surcharge, minus collection charges, that will become the divisible pool, please don't forget. And there are some exceptions. I am not going into those exceptions. Just look at it. These are the exceptions. And other than these exceptions, gross tax revenues minus cess, minus surcharge, minus collection charges, then that will become divisible pool. And divisible pool is to be apportioned between the center and the states. And please don't forget. As per the 14th Finance Commission recommendations, 42 percent is given to the states and friends, this is known as a vertical distribution, right? So, friends, when you look at Finance Commission, vertical distribution is one aspect, horizontal distribution is another aspect, right friends? Horizontal distribution means distribution among the states and equity and efficiency. These two are important aspects, most important. The Finance Commission looks at equity and efficiency both. And unit cost of delivery of services is the main theme while deciding these horizontal distribution. That means, some states may have some disadvantages. Very important, some states may have some disadvantages, geographical disadvantages. Some states may have tribal areas, some states may have hilly areas for which the delivery of services may be difficult and revenue generation may be difficult. And for all such difficult states, there is a mechanism of grants in aid. Friends, these terms are very important when one looks at the Finance Commission. So, friends, we already deliberated about vertical distribution, then horizontal distribution. And while deciding the horizontal distribution, please don't forget equity and efficiency, these two terms, equity and efficiency, right? And at the same time, unit cost of delivery of services, that is the important term used in the Finance Commission deliberations. 
then if you see these are only advisory most important is finance commission recommendations are advisory not binding on the government but as the finance commission is constitutional body and expected to be quasi judicial its recommendations cannot be turned down normally by the government i hope you got the sufficient idea about it and terms of reference if you look at the terms of reference and basically 14th finance commission has taken for the horizontal distribution i already told you vertical distribution is between center and the states right that is gross tax revenue minus cess minus surcharge minus collection charges after that whatever is left over that will become divisible pool and as per 14th finance commission 42% of divisible pool is given to the states we have to wait and see how much percentage will be given by the 15th finance commission from the divisible pool to the states and once that is decided then the next step is horizontal distribution how to distribute among the states and here as per 14th finance commission here fiscal capacity or income distance as i have already told you fiscal capacity is constrained because of various reasons hill areas forest areas geographical difficulties because of all those things fiscal capacity is in fact becoming problematic for several states right and here fiscal capacity that is 50% 1971 population 17.5% 2011 population 10% area 15% forest cover 7.5% like that based on all these things horizontal distribution is done please don't get confused it looks at vertical distribution horizontal distribution so to do horizontal distribution these are the important aspects for the 14th finance commission if you look at 15th finance commission terms of reference became controversial why they became controversial the first and the foremost aspect is finance commission shall use the population data of 2011 census not 1971 census and the states which controlled population such as kerala such as tamil nadu they will be disadvantages so therefore there is lot of hue and cry about the terms of the reference and please don't forget center has got the power to give terms of reference to the commission most important and performance based incentives based on the deepening of the tax net under gst and efforts made by the states in moving towards replacement level of the population growth and similarly how the states are implementing central schemes this also became second controversial thing first one is population second controversial thing is how the states are implementing central schemes then other recommendations are based on how the states are taking steps for improving the capital expenditure right friends this is important from your prelims perspective so i told you number of important aspects with regard to 15th finance commission right we will also deliberate in the revision classes let us come back to the present discussion right so whatever is deliberated in this round table as per the amended frbm act please don't forget this is also important the central government shall take appropriate steps to ensure that the general government debt that shall not exceed 60% 40% for the center 20% for the states and it is mentioned here the central government debt shall not exceed 40% of gdp by the end of financial year 2024 25 right friends so as per amended frbm act the central government shall take appropriate steps to ensure that the general government debt does not exceed 60% so accumulation of fiscal deficit will become the debt and the overall debt for the center and the states shall not exceed 60% and for the center 40% what is the target target is 2024 25 please remember and one of the terms of reference to the finance commission is to review the 
current level of debt of union and the states and what is the present level of debt for the union if you see the present level of debt is around 49 percent which is expected to come down to 47 percent in 2019-20 as per the budget figures but if you look at the state governments it is 23.4 percent what is the goal 20 percent but the important aspect is there are huge variations if you look at Punjab it is 46 percent if you look at Chhattisgarh it is 15 percent so there are huge variations across the states this is going to be real challenge then the next one is intergovernmental transfer design and fiscal equalization and the major task of finance commission is addressing vertical and horizontal imbalances in the fiscal resources between union and the states i already told you what is horizontal what is vertical right and unit cost of delivery service delivery that is in fact the main theme of equalization unit cost of service delivery that means if you take some state like Manipur the unit cost of service delivery is higher than the state you take Kerala or Tamil Nadu so therefore unit cost of service delivery because of the difficult geographical terrain that is to be considered and friends please don't forget the most important aspect is equity very important equity means whether you are born in Manipur whether you are born in Kerala whether you are born in Uttar Pradesh you are entitled for equal level of services so when the cost of delivery is high in Manipur please give more resources to Manipur if the cost of delivery is less in Kerala please give less resources so friends this is the meaning of equity very important two principles of the finance commission equity and efficiency that means what is efficiency efficiency please don't forget that means when you are looking at finance commission let me tell you once again one is equity second one is efficiency that means the finance commission has to look at two ways first one is equity that means whether you are born in Manipur, Kerala or Uttar Pradesh you should be entitled for equal level of service and to ensure equity difficult states may require more resources sometimes grants and the developed states may require lesser money so friends that is equity second one is efficiency that means some of the states say Maharashtra say Kerala they are efficient in various aspects if you look at the population control they may be efficient if you look at the generation of the resources if you look at the optimum utilization of resources they may be efficient so therefore the main task of this finance commission is to look at two aspects one is equity second one is efficiency both should be incentivized or you can say finance commission should look at both that is the important aspect and revenue generation of the third tier of government and friends please don't forget GST subsumed not only the taxes at the central level but also at the state level but also at the local level so now the important aspect is major sources of raising revenue for the third tier of government that is local bodies and the real challenge is how to make local bodies raise their own resources instead of dependent on states instead of dependent on center how do they in fact mobilize the resources and one such resource is property taxation right so these are the important issues deliberated with regard to this finance commission so friends, this concludes today's editorial discussion. Have a nice day. Thank you.